Hi again, guys. Um, we're going to get through this compare and contrast, but the thing I really want you to get out of these reading uh, videos is the quality of the work by this writer, Patricia Palacco. Um, as we go through the books, you're going to see that the illustrations kind of resemble each other, which would be another way that we could compare the books. And also, <laughs> there seems to be these consistent themes that circulate around family. There's not really any focus on animals or big groups of people or events like that, but it's mainly about family and how families work together. So we could say it's sort of a theme um, of her books. And interestingly, when you find out about Patricia Polacco, you find out that um, much of what she wrote is probably based on things that happened in her own life. In fact, one of her books actually has photographs of her and her brother um, and different things that happened to them. So at some point, I'm going to show those to you. But for right now, <clears throat> let's say a quick prayer, and we'll get started in um, comparing and contrasting some additional books by Patricia Polacco. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a new day. We thank you for being the great Father that cares about us so much that even in the midst of times when we can't be together as a class, that you are uh, with us in whatever home we're in and watching over us and keeping us well. Uh, you have the capacity. You are omnipresent. You are everywhere, and we are grateful for that. Lord, we pray for your continued protection. We pray that you will continue to keep us healthy and well. And once again, we thank you for loving us so much, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, so just as a reminder, we read Thunder Cake, and it was about a little girl and her grandmother during a thunderstorm making a cake. That's summarizing it. Then we read Babushka's Doll, which was about a grandmother and her little granddaughter, and a doll who came to life and somehow taught that girl, the little girl, Natasha, a lesson. So today we're going to read another book by Patricia Polacco, and we're going to try and look for ways that this particular book might be similar to Babushka's Doll. So very quickly, Babushka's Doll takes place with, and in the story, there's a farm involved with goats and chickens and all of that. There's a grandmother. There's a little girl named Natasha. And there's a problem because the little girl isn't very kind and she's kind of selfish. But she learns a lesson, just like in Thunder Cake, where the little girl learned that she can be very brave. So this particular book is called Thank You, Mr. Falker. And if we look at the cover, we can see a little girl. So wait a minute. That sounds like what was in the other two books, right? In this case, there's a teacher that I guess we can kind of assume this is Mr. Falker because he's sort of standing there. There's books and, <coughs> and pens and pencils and all that kind of thing, paper. So we're going to compare and contrast, <coughs> excuse me, and this time we're going to be talking about Babushka's Doll, this book, and thank you, Mr. Falker. <coughs> so I'm going to read you the story. Once again, think about how it might be the same as Babushka's Doll and how it might be different, okay? Uh, let me see if I can get this book open. And there we see a very happy little girl, right? And, oh, and once again, it's by Patricia Palacco. Patricia Palacco is the author that we're, whose books we are reading, okay? And here's a, a curious picture on the front, a picture of a, a book, and that is a jar of honey. But we'll find out why those two things are there. Ready? Hmm. Let me read what it says. The grandpa held the jar of honey so that all the family could see. Then he dipped a ladle into it and drizzled honey on the cover of a small book. 
The little girl had just turned five. Stand up, little one, he cooed. I did this for your mother, your uncles, your older brother, and now you. Then he handed the book to her. Taste. She dipped her finger into the honey and put it into her mouth. What is that taste, the grandma asked. Ooh, I hear grandma. Hmm, there must be a grandma involved. The little girl answered, sweet. Then all of the family said in a single voice, yes, and so is knowledge. But knowledge is like the bee that made that sweet honey. You have to chase it through the pages of a book. The little girl knew that the promise to read was at last hers. Soon, she was going to learn to read. Trisha, the littlest girl in the family, grew up loving books. Her school teacher mother read to her every night. Her red-headed brother brought his books home from school and shared them. And whenever she visited the family farm, her... Ooh, a farm. Hmm. That's interesting. Her grandfather or grandmother read to her by the stone fireplace. When she turned five and went to kindergarten, most of all, she hoped to read. Each day, she saw the kids in the first grade across the hall reading, and before the year was over, some of the kids in her own class began to read. Not Tricia. Still, she loved being at school because she could draw. The other kids would crowd around her and watch her do her magic with the crayons. In first grade, you'll learn to read, her brother said. So she's kind of happy because she's a good um, drawer, a good illustrator. Um, so interesting. And her name is Trisha, and the author's name is Patricia. Anyway, let's look at this picture now. Does she look happy in that picture? In my mind, the word that comes to my mind when I see her face is frustrated. In first grade, Trisha sat in a circle with the other kids. They were all holding our neighborhood, their first reader, sounding out letters and words. Sounds like you guys. They said, bet, bet, boy, bet, boy, boy, and look, 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 look. The teacher smiled at them when they put all the sounds together and got a word right. But when Trisha looked at the page, all she saw were wiggling shapes, and when she tried to sand out words, the other kids laughed at her. Trisha, what are you looking at in that book, they'd say. I'm reading, she'd say back to them. But her teacher would move on to the next person. Always, when it was her turn to read, her teacher had to help her with every single word. And while the other kids moved up into the second reader, and the third reader, she stayed alone in our neighborhood, which is the name of the book. Trisha began to feel different. She began to feel dumb. So let's look at that picture again. So we've seen some characters. There's Trisha, her grandmother, her grandfather. She's looks like it's taking place at school. So we, remember, we're trying to remember to ask questions of ourselves, like who and what and where. Um, and when, so when she's in first kindergarten and first grade. Um, but what's the problem? That's the really important question. And in this case, as I'm reading, I realize the problem is this is a little girl who's very discouraged because she's not able to read the way she would like to like all of her friends. That looks like a grandmother and a little girl. Hmm. Sounds an awful lot like some other books that we read. The harder words got for the little girl, the more and more time she spent drawing. How she loved to draw. Or just sitting and dreaming or, when she could, going for walks with her grandmother. One summer day, she and her grandma were walking together in the small woods behind their farm. Hmm, grandmother, little girl farm. It was twilight. Ah, I remember grandfather, twilight. Ah, good thing to think about that, too. The air was sweet and warm. Fireflies were just coming up from the grasses. 
Now one thing I can tell you is that I know fireflies generally only come out in the summertime, so it must be summer. That's when this is happening. As they walked, Trisha said, Grandma, do you think I'm different? Of course, her grandma answered. To be different is the miracle of life. You see all of those little fireflies. Everyone is different. Do you think I'm smart? Trisha, Trisha didn't feel smart. Her grandma hugged her. You are the smartest, quickest, dearest little thing ever. Right then, the little girl felt safe in her grandma's arms. Reading didn't matter so much. Trisha's grandma used to say that the stars were holes in the sky. And we know that. They're not holes. They're actually big balls of hot gas. They were the light of heaven coming from the other side. And she used to say that someday she would be on the other side, where the light comes from, heaven. One evening, they lay on the grass and counted the lights from heaven. You know, her grandma said, all of us will go there someday. She means heaven. Hang on to the grass, or you'll lift right off the ground, and, and there you'll be. They laughed and both hung on to the grass. But it was not long after that night that her grandma must have let go of the grass because she went to where the lights were on the other side. And not long after that, Trisha's grandpa let go of the grass, too. School seemed harder and harder now. Why do you think that made it harder? Think about how her grandma was with her. Reading was just plain torture. When Sue Ellen read her page, or Tommy Bob read his page, they read so easily that Trisha would watch the top of their heads to see if something was happening to their heads that wasn't happening to hers. And numbers were the hardest thing of all to read. She never added anything right. Line the numbers up before you add them, the teacher would say. But when Trisha tried, the numbers looked like a stack of blocks, wobbly and ready to fall. She just knew she was dumb. Then one day, her mother said that she had gotten a teaching job in California, a long way from the family farm in Michigan. So here's Trisha in school with all of her friends who are reading, and she can't read. Even though her grandma and grandpa were gone, the little girl didn't want to move. Maybe, though, the teachers and kids in her new school wouldn't know how dumb she was. She and her mother and brother moved across the country in a two-tone 1949 Plymouth. It took five days, probably because they didn't drive all day and all night. But at the new school, uh-oh, that doesn't look too good, does it? That doesn't look good at all. But at the new school, it was the same. When she tried to read, she stumbled over words. The c c c cat ran. She was reading like a baby in the third grade. And when her teacher read along with them and called on Trisha for an answer, she gave the wrong answer every time. Hey, dummy, a boy called out to her on the playground. How come you're so dumb? The other kids stood near him and they laughed. Trisha could feel the tears burning in her eyes. How she longed to go back to her grandparents' farm in Michigan. She doesn't have her grandma anymore encouraging her either. Now Trisha wanted to go to school less and less. Oh, I have a sore throat, she'd say to her mother, or I have a stomach ache. She dreamed more and more and drew more and more, and she hated, hated, hated school. Then when Trisha started fifth grade, the school was all a buzz. That means there was a lot of excitement. There was a new teacher. He was tall and elegant. That means he was dressed very nicely. Everybody loved his striped coat and slick gray pants. He wore the neatest clothes. All the usual teacher's pets gathered around him, Stevie Joe and Alice Marie, Davy and Michael Lee. But right from the start, 
It didn't seem to matter to Mr. Falker which kids were the cutest or the smartest or the best at anything. So there's Mr. Falker. So now we have a new character that we didn't see in the other books, right? And the other books took place mostly on the farm, and here it looks like taking place mostly in school. Looks like some differences. Mr. Falker would stand behind Trisha whenever she was drawing and whisper, This is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Do you know how talented you are? When he said this, even the kids who teased her would turn around in their seats and look at her drawings. But they still laughed whenever she gave a wrong answer. Then one day she had to stand up and read, which she hated. She was stumbling through a page in Charlotte's Web, and the page was going all fuzzy when the kids began to laugh out loud. Mr. Falker, in his plaid jacket and his butterfly tie, said, Stop! Are all of you so perfect that you can look at another person and find fault? That sounds like something that happened in the Bible when Jesus told the people that were going after a young woman, Are you without sin? That was the last day anyone laughed out loud or made fun of her, all except Eric. He had sat behind Trisha for two whole years, but he seemed almost to hate her, and Trisha didn't know why. He waited by the door of the classroom for her and pulled her hair. He waited for her on the playground and leaned in her face and called her Toad. I don't know why Toad, but... Trisha was afraid to turn any corner for fear Eric would be there. She felt completely alone. The only time she was really happy was when she was around Mr. Falker. He let her erase the blackboards. Only the best students got to do that. He patted her on the back whenever she got something right, and look, he looked hard and mean at any kid who teased her. But the nicer Mr. Falker was to Trisha, the worse Eric treated her. He got all the other kids to wait for her on the playground or in the cafeteria or even in the bathroom and to jump out and call her stupid or ugly. And Trisha began to believe them. She discovered that if she could just ask to go to the bathroom just before recess, she could hide under the inside stairwell during the free time and not have to go outside at all. In that dark place, she felt safe. That's kind of sad, isn't it? You wouldn't want your friends or people in your class to feel that way, would you? But one day at recess, Eric followed her to her secret hiding place. Have you become a mole, he laughed. And he pulled her out into the hallway and danced around her. Dumbbell, dumbbell, maggoty old dumbbell. Trisha buried her head in her arms and curled up in a ball. Suddenly she heard footsteps. It was Mr. Falker. He marched Eric down to the office, and when he came back, he found Trisha. I don't think you'll have to worry about that boy any again, he said softly. What was he teasing you about, little one? I don't know, Trisha shrugged. Oops, I want to make sure you see this picture. It's important. So there's Eric being caught by Mr. Falker and taken to the office. Trisha was sure Mr. Falker believed that she could read. She had learned to memorize what the kid next to her was reading. Or she would wait for Mr. Falker to help her with a sentence. Then she'd say the same thing that he did. Good, he would say. Then one day, Mr. Falker asked her to stay after school and help wash the blackboards. He put on music and brought out little sandwiches as they worked and talked. All at once, he said, let's play a game. I'll shout out letters. You write them on the board with the wet sponge as quickly as you can. A, he shouted. She wiped a watery A. Eight, he shouted. She made a watery eight. Fourteen, three, D, M, Q, he shouted out. He shouted out many, many letters and numbers. Then he walked up behind her, and together they looked at the board. It was a watery mess. Trisha knew that none of the letters or numbers looked like they should. She threw the sponge down and tried to run. But Mr. Falker caught her arm and sank to his knees in front of her. You poor baby, he said. You think you're dumb, don't you? How awful for you to be so lonely and afraid. She sobbed. But, little one, don't you understand? You don't see letters or numbers the way other people do. 
and you've gotten through school all this time and fooled many, many good teachers. He smiled at her. That took cunning and smartness and such, such bravery. Then he stood up and finished washing the board. We're going to change all that, girl. You're going to read. I promise you that. Now, almost every day after school, she w met with Mr. Falker and Miss Plessy, a reading teacher. They did a lot of things she didn't even understand. At first, she made circles in sand, and then big sponge circles on the blackboard going from left to right, left to right. Another day, they flicked letters on a screen, and Trisha, sh Trisha shouted them out loud. Still other days, she worked with wooden blocks and built words, letters, 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 words, 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 always sounding them out, and that felt good. But though she'd read words, she hadn't read a whole sentence, and deep down, she still felt dumb. And then, one spring day, had it been three months or four months since they had started? Mr. Falker put a book in front of her. She'd never seen it before. He picked up a paragraph in the middle of a page and pointed at it. Almost as if it were magic, or as if light poured into her brain, the words and sentences started to take shape on the page as they never had before. She marched them off to... Slowly, she read a sentence, then another, and another, and finally, she'd read a whole paragraph, and she understood the whole thing. She didn't notice that Mr. Falker and Miss Plessy had tears in their eyes. Notice the background. This is really important because there's the holes in the sky that her grandmother talked about. I remember her grandfather was talking about her learning to read. That night, Trisha ran home without stopping to catch her breath. She bounded up the front steps, threw open her front door, and ran through the dining room to the kitchen. She climbed up on the, on the cupboard and grabbed a jar of honey. Then she went into the living room and found the book on a shelf, the very book that her grandpa had shown her so many years ago. She spooned honey on the cover and tasted the sweetness and said to herself, The honey is sweet, and so is knowledge. But knowledge is just like the bee who made the honey. It has to be chased through the pages of a book. Then she held the book, the honey, and all close to her chest. She could feel tears roll down her cheeks, but they weren't tears of sadness. She was happy, so very happy. So you're looking out at the stars, maybe thinking of her grandma and her grandpa. The rest of the year became an odyssey of discovery and adventure for the little girl. She learned to love school. I know because that little girl was me, Patricia Polacco. I saw Mr. Falker again some 30 years later at a wedding. I walked up to him and introduced myself. At first, he had difficulty placing me. Then I told him who I was and how he had changed my life so many years ago. He hugged me and asked me what I did for a living. Why, Mr. Falker, I answered, I make books for children. Thank you, Mr. Falker. Thank you. All right. So I, I think that's a wonderful book, especially since I'm a teacher and I always want to be inspired to, to help my students. But in this case, let's compare and contrast before we run out of time. So first of all, we know that as we compare this book to Babushka's doll, both books have a little girl and a grandma. So I'm going to put that down, kind of like our other book, Thunder Cake. And another way that they're the same is while the the setting for uh, Thank You, Mr. Falker, changed just to a school in California. It did have some of the time on a farm, which was true in her in the other book. Another important thing is that an adult helped a, a, a little girl learn a lesson. In this case, it wasn't the grandma, but it was an adult. So 
I'm going to write in the middle of the two books, little girl learns a lesson. And in Thank You, Mr. Falker, it was a lesson that she was good enough. And, you know, in, our, in the Bible, we're told that God has created us, and he's created us just the way we should be. And she was created to be an, an author of children's books, and it took someone to help her see that she was able to do that. All right, how were they different? Well, in Babushka's doll, we had a doll. And thank you, Mr. Falker. See, I put the doll. We had a teacher. And in, the, in Babushka's doll, the doll taught the little girl a lesson. And thank you, Mr. Falker, the teacher taught the girl a lesson about how good she is. And thank you, Mr. Falker. There was a lot of being at the school, okay? School and school activities. In Babushka's doll, there was a lot on the farm. The goat cart and feeding the goats and chickens and all that kind of thing. So um, I'm going to tell that as my contrast is the farm life, okay? So I've completed this chart, and once again, there's more that you could probably add, other things that I didn't put in here, but you think about and you say, well, you know, there was other things. There were students that weren't in the other book. There was um, trying to read in one book and trying to be patient in the other book. So I want you to think about how those, how those differences appear because we're going to continue to compare the books that she wrote and continue to look at how they are different, contrasting them. So, that's, that's for today, and eventually you're going to have to do this yourself. But for right now, this was my teaching you. Um, I hope you enjoyed the book, and I look forward to our next video. All right, bye.